It gives me great pleasure to invite our first speaker, Dr. Vineet Govind Gupta, medical oncologist from Delhi. Over to you, sir. Yeah, hi. Uh, so thanks a lot and <clears throat> real pleasure for me to <clears throat> be the opening batsman on this academic feast. So the topic which I'm going to discuss is uh, chemo radiation followed by immuno versus perioperative chemoimmunotherapy in stage 3 lung cancer and I have 15 minutes for this topic. So let me just get right into it. So um, so first let's start with the NCCN guideline because uh, the lot that is that represents for you know many of us the standard of care. And if you look at NCCN what they recommend is that for T1 to 3 and 0 to 1 they recommend that resectable patients should have surgery with or without perioperative systemic therapy, preoperative systemic therapy. And for medically inoperable, we treat uh, as per clinical stage. And for N2 node positive, the first category recommendation is chemo radiation as per the guidelines. But you know, there are a lot of advantages to following a new adjuvant kind of approach, which, you know, which gradually we are seeing in more and more kind of uh, different cancer types. We can get early control of systemic disease with lower risk of micrometastasis, which lead to a long-term survival benefit. You can determine the tumor biology by NC2 exposure, which has prognostic and predictive implications. You can reduce the tumor bulk to lower morbidity and greater ease in surgery. And you can identify the small subset of patients who have very poor biology and who might be better off with a palliative growth rather than unnecessary surgery. And I think the realization is setting in that new adjuvant is the way to go for immunotherapy for majority of uh, cancer uh, subsites because you get to prime the immune system with majority of tumor antigens in place. And when you have the tumor antigen, T cell and APCs together, that is where the magic happens and you get the activation of the immune system. So probably you have to cook the tumor with the PD-1 inhibitor and the T cells to get the best response from immunotherapy. So two possible objections that somebody might have to new adjuvant chemotherapy approach would be a risk of progression that maybe when you give new adjuvant chemo, some patients might progress during NST and become stage 4, therefore losing a curative window of opportunity and maybe they could have been cured by CTRT or NSCT might debilitate the patient or harm critical organ leading to high surgical morbidity or mortality. So if we look at the checkmate 816 study among patients with stage 1b to 3a non-small cell lung cancer without any sensitizing EGFR or ALK mutation who were randomized to nevo chemo versus chemo alone for three cycles before going for surgery. Uh, the If you look at the response rates, you can see that in the patients who got nivolumab and chemo, only 4.5% actually had progressive disease. And you can see here the waterfall plots, they are very satisfying. And ultimately, 83.2% of patients who got nevo chemo, they underwent definitive surgery. Among the patients where surgery was cancelled, disease progression was the reason for cancellation of surgery in only 6.7% of patients. And R0 resection was performed in 83.2% of patients with the nevo chemo group. And if you look at the uh, uh, three-year EFS and OS data, although OS has not yet hit the significance boundary, the uh, hazard ratio for EFS and OS is 0.68 and 0.62 respectively. Similarly, the EGEN study where uh, there it, it is new adjuvant durvalumab with chemo for four cycles, followed by durvalumab every four weeks for 12 cycles with a somewhat similar, but there is an adjuvant immunotherapy component. Also, the... Uh, uh, path CR response and uh, major pathological response rates are somewhat similar to checkmate 816 and uh, there's a long-term EFS benefit. You can see here the hazard ratio is 0 0.68 in agent. So with chemoimmunotherapy, less than 5% of patients have primary progressive disease. 83% had underwent surgery as planned and I think patient who remain acceptable, they can patient who progressed to stage 4 may not have been curative to begin with. So Theoretically, immunotherapy is expected to be more active in new adjuvant setting. And the high path CR rates seem to be comparable to tumor where NSCT is actually considered standard. So in breast cancer, path CR rate of 20-30% is considered as acceptable enough to make it a standard. So maybe we need to think in that direction. The other approach might, the other objection might be it will debilitate the patient too much, leading to high surgical morbidity mortality. But that is also not borne out by the data. In this study from 2010, uh, in 56 matched patients, there was no increase in surgical morbidity or mortality among patients who got new adjuvant chemotherapy 
commit to patient who underwent for surgery directly. And in checkmate 816 also, the risk of fatal adverse events seem to be similar between the two arms and mostly seems to be unrelated to the kind of toxicity we are looking for. So if you look at the ASCO guideline for N2 NSCLC specifically, it says that you can consider surgery where a complete section is deemed possible, N3 are not involved, and perioperative mortality is expected to be low. So this is, I think, the one major area of controversy that what to do with N2 patients who are potentially resectable, where some would go for surgery and some would still go for CTRT. So the SAKK 16-14 study uh, explored specifically N2 patients. It was a study of T123 N2 patients who had resectable disease. And patients received cisplatin docetaxel uh, followed by durvalumab, followed by surgery, as well, followed by durvalumab maintenance in this study. And uh, importantly, the population is only N2 patients. And what they found was 62% MPR, 18% PATCR, 93% R0 resection, and one year EFS of 73%. And quite uh, good looking survival curves in EFS and OS. So acting as a uh, proof of concept that this is a viable approach. So what about chemo radiation followed by durvalumab? So preferred for undesectable patients for medical or surgical reason, not willing for surgery or 3P or higher. So long-term survival in the Pacific study, you can see the data here. So at five years, there is an absolute difference of almost 9%, which is quite uh, important. I think one of the most uh, significant differences and probably something which started the use of immuno in the curative setting. But one major issue is immuno is a highly efficacious therapy with potential for long-term benefit, but not all patients who undergo CTRT will get durvalumab. So you can see in the uh, Pacific study, out of 93 enrolled patients, 270 patients actually never were able to be randomized. So some might be progressing soon after CTRT, some might be too unfit for adjuvant immuno after the morbidity of CTRT, or for any reason, not every patient will be able to get the adjuvant durvalumab. So they're missing out on an on a important and efficient kind of therapy. And even with uh, CTRT and Durvalumab, more than 50% of patients are still going to die despite getting this therapy. So you can see in stage 3A, 54% uh, of patients had died at the five-year landmark. So majority of patients still, uh, there's a lot of unmet ground to cover. So there are multiple points favoring the NACT approach. There, is a, there seems to be a low risk of losing curative patients by following this approach. And the objective and pathological response rates are high enough to compare to other tumors where new adjuvant chemotherapy is often the standard of care for stage 3 disease. The post-CTRT IU option is nice to have, but a good proportion of patients will not get it or not benefit from it. And you can get prognostic information from pathological data, maybe which can guide the next generation of clinical trials. So my approach uh, will be MDT discussion for every patient. And for resectable disease, I would probably want to prefer an NACT approach. But of course, if the disease is not acceptable or patient is unwilling for surgery, then CTRT with immunotherapy is the way to go. So I'll end on that and thank you all very much. Thank you so much, sir. I would now like to invite our next speaker, Dr. Arvind Kumar, thoracic surgeon from Gurugram. Over to you, sir. Arvind, sir, you will have to unmute. Good. Yeah, yeah, I've done that. Am I audible? Yes, sir. And is my slide visible? Yes, sir. sir. Perfect, sir. Okay. So, good evening, everyone. And uh, first of all, a sincere thanks to Dr. Ulas Batra, his team, and the team at AstraZeneca for this uh, opportunity. And... Uh, so my uh, topic is role of surgery in locally advanced lung cancer. I bring you greetings from Medanta, from my team here. Uh, since the time allotted is 15 minutes, so what I'll do is to very briefly, uh, I do not know if there are residents also, but uh, just define what we have as locally advanced lung cancer treatment options and decision making. The slides are many in number, but I'll be going through them quickly 
and finishing in 15 minutes, which are allotted to me. Uh, locally advanced lung cancer forms uh, nearly 30% of patients uh, affected with non-small lung cancer. It's actually a very wide spectrum. Uh, on one hand, you have a certain T3, T4, and on the other hand, you have N2, N3. So from both sides, uh, you have contribution coming to the uh, stage, locally advanced group. We used to have earlier T3, A, and B, but now the latest edition also makes T3, C. Most of this disease is non-surgical, and despite the absence of metastasis, their prognosis is severe with a very dismal five-year survival till now. I'm sure in times to come, the newer, uh, very phenomenal developments uh, in systemic therapy will make a dent on this and change this number. But yeah, at present, uh, there are different options, and um, uh, so it's a therapeutic challenge. Though the intent remains cure in the absence of a of any detectable distant metastasis, but that cure remains elusive, except for a small percentage of cases. Local control is important. Surgery, radiotherapy remain important. But as was mentioned in the concluding uh, remarks by my pre previous speaker, multidisciplinary treatment is the key. So as you would see, it's a very heterogeneous group starting from T3, N1, N2, N3, or T4. So this is divided into T3A, and which could be because of uh, T3 or T4, or it could be T3A because of N2, and then we have a 3B, and now a recently added 3C also. While prognosis of this heterogeneous group is uniformly bad. However, it's such a heterogeneous group with respect to treatment that if we look very carefully at it, we actually can figure out three different subsets. So we have 3A because of non-N2. So that's our T3, N1 and T4, N0 or N1. This, this patient does not have N2 but is is uh, T3, uh, uh, is uh, uh, 3A because of T3, T4. So this is non-N2 T3A disease, 3A disease. Then you have a disease which is uh, N2, and because of that, it is 3A. And within N2, you may have a very uh, micrometastasis situation, or you may have a multi-station, uh, huge uh, uh, unresectable kind of lymph nodes, and it is the extent of nodal disease at a location and number of locations, which actually determines whether you go for surgery or not. However, surgery remains a possibility, not applicable to every patient, but at least a possibility in good numbers. So this uh, non-N2 T3A and N2 T3A is still are to some extent in the realm of surgery. However, when it comes to T3B, uh, a 3B or 3C, uh, then obviously these are absolutely non-surgical diseases where surgery does not help at all. So you have 3A non-N2, which, which goes for resection, plus adjuvant treatment, which is similar to stage two. You have 3AN2 disease, which goes either for upfront uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy followed by resection or resection followed by adjuvant treatment always. And most important issue is that bulk and extent of nodal disease determines the approach of these patients. And as I said, 3B and 3C are diseases where stages where surgery is not beneficial at all. Now, when it comes to your non-N2 3A, which is T3 N1 or T4 N0 N1, here surgery has a central role in treatment. Planning depends on resectability. However, there's one thing which we always keep hammering. There is no role at all of a debulking surgery in the setting of lung cancer. So the surgeon has to very meticulously, carefully do the analysis of CT, etc., 
to be sure that yes, you are going to be able to reset. But I would insist that many a times this decision that no, 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 it's a doubtful resectability is taken by others without involving the surgeon. That again is an unfair situation. So a surgeon experienced in doing these kind of cases should be involved, but it should not be him alone. It should be a multidisciplinary tumor board where surgeon looks at his you know, ability to resect those. And if he has a reasonable certainty of being able to resect, you go ahead. Because read the last line, completeness of resection is the primary determinant of survival in these patients. So if you make an effort and you're not able to resect, you actually harm the patient more than you do good to those patients. So uh, approach is similar to stage 2B in these patients. You do it the same way. So I have put some slides because I knew I'm addressing medical oncologists and if I don't show data, then it will be not complete. In surgical presentations, I usually avoid showing data, but whenever I'm ad addressing medical oncologists, I always show, but I'm not going to read it. Uh, I would just highlight that there are enough experience reported in the literature where you know things like SVC resection if needed, carinal resection, thoracic inlet, aorta, et cetera. So there are enough reports of these structures being able to be resected. The bottom line is these surgeries are all complicated surgeries and should only be done at centers. So at centers which are experienced. So when it comes to carinal resection and reconstruction, we've been doing these regularly, which could be involving you know, the right side or the left side. But I must say that these are technically very, very demanding operations with a significant morbidity, occasional mortality also, and preparing the patient, addressing, checking the fitness of the patient and experience, not just of the surgeon, but the entire team, which includes anesthetist, his support staff, critical care support, all that is vital. If you're sure of that, then only you should attempt these cases. Otherwise, you may do more harm than the good you will do to these cases. So this is a possibility, but it's a difficult thing to achieve technically. So consensus recommends resection wherever feasible along with adjuvant therapy. Now, when we come to the, the N2, 3A, then there is a lot of debate whether NACT followed by surgery, surgery followed by adjuvant therapy, whether you should have a palliative approach or a curative intent CTRT. This is actually the largest cohort, but Although grouped in one group, it actually is a heterogeneous group because not all N2 are similar disease. It varies from, it could be an occult N2 where there was no, your preoperative invasive mediastinal staging did not show N2. You went ahead, you did a systematic radical mediastinal lymph node dissection and there you may have uh, lymph nodes being now reported to be positive, which again could be a single station or a multi-station. So that's occult N2, not known earlier. Or a uh, pre-operatively mediastinal staging detected N2 disease, which again could be single station or multi-station, bulky or non-bulky. And you have a stage where you have a large multi-station, bulky kind of uh, lymph nodes, which are fixed and increasing. Obviously, the first one is a post-surgical diagnosis. The second one is a pre-operative diagnosis where there continues to be debate. I'm showing the slide, but I'm going to skip them. And I would suffice by saying that my approach is that if I'm pretty sure about being able to resect the entire visible disease with a reasonable certainty and patient does not have too many morbidities, thereby increasing the risk of surgery, I would remove whatever is removable, which means a curative intent. But if there is any doubt, obviously, this patient will not be taken up for surgery. So I'll skip these slides. And the next question that comes in these cases is when these patients, so whether it should be, when it comes to induction, should it be CT or CTRT? Again, I'll 
not go into details, but uh, suffices to say, and again, this is I'm reporting as a surgeon, whenever we have given upfront radiotherapy also, operating on the irradiated chest is actually a very difficult situation with a very high incidence of post-op problems. Another question that often faces us is that, if we have a otherwise resectable situation, but the location of the tumor suggests that this patient will end up not in a lobectomy, but pneumonectomy. Should pneumonectomy be offered as a treatment or cure for 3A and 2 disease? Again, uh, there are all kinds of reports available. There are people who have reported favorable reports. There are people who have said that if your morbidity and mortality of doing a pneumonectomy is pretty high, then the whatever additional benefit you are getting is actually set off. So in general, I would say that if pneumonectomy is going to be 100% required, probably your answer should be no. However, it can be considered and should be considered in some very selected patients who are young and fit with non-bulky single station disease. So this was about the surgical approach. Then we can take them up by thoracotomy or VATS by robotic. Thoracotomy works well. People say today consider thoracotomy as something which is antique, but I would say that even today, even in a place like US, more than half of all patients are actually being operated by thoracotomy, despite so much of penetration of VATS and robotic. We are fortunate that as a group of seven consultants, we are offering VATS to more of most of the patients. So this is a VATS in process, or we have robotic. The superiority of robotic over the VATS is the 3D vision which the surgeon occupies and also the, the amphidextrity which comes because of the ability to manipulate both the joysticks and the very precise dissection that you can do with the robot. So there are definite advantages in dissection available with the robot and you have excellent outcome with patients, you know, recovering and walking uh, on the next day. But if you look at the literature, has robotic lobectomy proved to be having superior outcomes than a VATS lobectomy? No, that answer is not yet there in the literature. So I would come to the last slide. So surgery for three, three, stage 3A, Bulk and extent of nodes dictate the algorithm. Optimal therapy and the role of surgery still remains controversial, especially now with such extensive use of uh, uh, immunotherapy, etc. Also in the neoadjuvant setting, uh, probably next few years we'll see a lot of change in the paradigms. So Complete pathological response and major sign and nodal clearance, uh, clearance are strong predictors of good survival. But most important is whoever accepts these cases should be having enough surgical expertise to be able to offer surgery with a very low morbidity and very, very low mortality. Further prognostic stratification will him improve. And I, as I said repeatedly, the ICIs are probably going to change the entire scenario in times to come. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. It gives me great pleasure to invite our international speaker, Dr. Luis Pazares, medical oncologist from Madrid, Spain. Over to you, sir. I'm okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for this nice uh, introduction. Hello? Yes, sir, we can hear you. So okay. would you like to share your screen? Okay, so I I don't know if you're able to, to see my slides. Is that okay? Yes, sir, we can see your slides. Okay, so thank you very much. So uh, should I start, right? Yes. Sir. Thank you. So first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to this very important uh, interesting uh, forum of discussion. Over the next few minutes, I will try to uh, give you my taking on the evolving perioperative immunotherapy therapies 
in uh, early stage uh, lung cancer. In the next slide, you will see my discussions. And this is the agenda uh, I'm going to follow today. Uh, why this is an unmet uh, clinical need? What do we have in terms of evidence for the adjuvant use of immunotherapy? Then new adjuvant immunotherapy plus or less chemotherapy. And finally, some goals on perioperative immunotherapy. And of course, uh, uh, the first thing we will uh, tackle is uh, why do we deal with immunotherapy here? And I think that is very self-evident. I mean, pretty sure all of you are aware that uh, uh, even with the use of uh, complementary chemotherapy before or after surgery for early stage non-small cell lung cancer, uh, we see that uh, some more than half of the patients do have relapses and the actual impact on survival is pretty small. I would say some extra, some ganancy of five years uh, uh, in, in terms of percentage of 5% uh, uh, ganancy at five years from 50 to 55%. And this is not uh, uh, important if we give chemotherapy before surgery or after surgery. For that reason, we tend to do in very localized stages, one, two, we tend to do surgery and then chemotherapy. On the contrary, for stages 3A, we tend to do chemo first uh, uh, and then surgery after the seminal work of Dr. Rochelle and Dr. Uh, uh, Bars and Dr. Ross and so on some 30 years ago. We have attempted to improve the outcome of our patients, to decrease the rate of relapse after surgery by using immunotherapy. And we have done a number of trials, particularly with vaccines. I just put in here this tremendous effort on the Magritte trial where more than uh, uh, 2,000 patients were recruited, more than 10,000 screened. And uh, unfortunately, as you see, the curves of survival were super impossible between treated uh, patients and untreated patients with uh, placebo. So uh, we learn again here that uh, this context, this tumor do have a microenvironment that is really, really immunosuppressive and uh, is really difficult for immunotherapy to work in that setting. However, over the last two decades, we have uh, also learned that uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors do work in lung cancer, particularly we knew that in later stages, stage four, pre-treated and untreated patients, even in stage three, huge impact on the post chemo radiation uh, uh, setting. And therefore it makes all the sense to prove it in early stage non-small cell lung cancer. Even more, we have now extensive data on the use of immunotherapy as adjuvant treatment uh, uh, for melanoma with huge impact in the cure rate. And we have learned more recently that maybe new adjuvant treatment is a more effective way to go. So with all these premises, it looks like uh, adjuvant immunotherapy should be taken into account uh, with the revisited drugs, with the revisited strategies of uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors. And actually, there are a number of ongoing trials uh, looking at the role of adjuvant immunotherapy with PD1, PDR1 inhibitors here. I just put here some five trials. One of them, the last trial is a negative one, not with a PD1, PD1 inhibitor but with canakinumab that, as you know, is an interleukin uh, one beta receptor inhibitor. But the other four trials are trial with PD-1 and PDL-1 inhibitors, very similar context, not identical. Patients treated with surgery because the stage one uh, uh, B23A 
uh, uh, after chemotherapy, typically some patients even didn't have chemo, were randomized to receive Pembro versus standard of care. Some uh, trials were placebo controlled, some others didn't. And I have to say two of those trials had already been analyzed and released, the Pembro trial and the tissue trial. And I'm gonna start with the uh, Empower 10 trial already disclosed some uh, 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 three years ago. You remember in that trial patients after surgery stage one, B23A uh, were treated always with chemo for four courses and then randomized to one year of a tissue versus very supportive care. Importantly, uh, uh, DFS was the primary endpoint. And of course, there was a hierarchical analysis. First, in PDR1 positive patients, always that were stage 2, 3A. Then all patients stage 2 to 3A, and if positive, the ITT population, including stage 1B. So that was a positive study, clear improvement in DFS, has a ratio 0.66, meaning you were decreasing the risk of relapse in the patient population 34%. That means you preventing one out of three relapses to happen. And that was true in the population of patients with stage 2 to 3A, if they were PDL1 more than 1% in the tumor cells. The analysis in the population that were 2 to 3A, regardless the PDL1 expression, was also positive. Baby, the hazard ratio was a bit lower, not 0.66, but 079 but if you analyze PDL1 positive and negatives, the significance was lost. So you go to the uh, 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 forest plot analysis, you realize that there is a clear indication that the higher the expression, the higher uh, the benefit. So those do with PDL1 more than 50% had a higher uh, benefit. And of course, if you look, yeah, uh, two patients with EGFR mutation and ALK rearrangements, there was not a clear indication of uh, benefit there. And consistently, never smokers were not clearly benefiting either. So this is the uh, uh, survival analysis that is somehow immature as yet. The maturity is still uh, pretty low. But uh, uh, as you see here, even the 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 hazard ratio is 0.7, is not, is crossing the, the unity, so not fully significant in the uh, population with a stage two to three, more than 1%, but you go to the population of patients with high PDR1 expression, more than 50%, you see a clear, very significant improvement, hazard ratio 0.42, that means you reduce it, the risk of, of dying more than 50%, you're preventing 60% of the deaths, which is really a very important number. Always the caution that uh, this is a secondary, somehow immature analysis as yet. Important in this trial is that the benefit was seen in patients that were CT DNA positive, before study entry, but also in those patients that there were CT DNA negative. So that means at present, we cannot indicate our adjuvant immunotherapy based on the uh, um, CT DNA levels, on the uh, measurements of residual disease by CT DNA because the methods are not sensitive enough. I told you that we have a parallel trial, the, the Keynote 091, very similar design with uh, 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 um, pembrolizumab. The only main difference is that patients that were having particularly stage 1B uh, uh, were strongly recommended 
to receive uh, uh, chemotherapy, but that was not mandatory. And indeed, some 15% of the patients in this trial didn't receive chemo before being randomized to Pembro versus placebo, but 85% did. You see here very separate impossible results. Decrease in the rate of relapse has a ratio of 0 0.76, very close to 0 0.66 we have seen with uh, uh, the uh, additional issue map. However, when you do the analysis in the population of patients with PDL1 more than 50%, the results were somehow unclear because the benefit was not any better. So there was not a confirmation that PDL1 is here important. That is somehow strange because uh, if you look at the data, uh, um, we typically expect that in this patient population, uh, uh, the outcome of placebo patients is behaving somehow very real. And you will see that you go to the inferior part, you realize that uh, uh, among patients treated with placebo in this trial, those patients with high PDL1 expression did better as compared to patients with low PDL1 expression. That is the reason why even patients in the plus in the high PDL1 expression arm did pretty well with Pembro. The problem is that those patients treated with placebo, they also overperform as compared to patients with low expression. You see here, low expressors in the placebo arm did worse as compared to uh, over expressors in the uh, um, uh, non-placebo arm. So that means I think what we have seen here in this comparison uh, of uh, Pembro versus placebo in the high pressures is a novel performance of the placebo arm. And that is the reason of this sub-analysis in this trial. That is the reason why we don't see a clear uh, uh, gradient of efficacy depending on PDL1. And, uh, uh, that is important. We have seen, however, that those spaces that are never smoker, they seem not to benefit here. And also uh, some relevant data is that non-squamous were not, sorry, squamous spaces were not clearly benefiting here. And of course, as I told you, this 15% of the patients with that didn't have chemotherapy before being randomized, they were not benefiting at all. So this is the overall survival data that were not positive either. And uh, the, uh, I would say, a safety profile were as expected. We didn't see any signal here different from that in stage four. We found the typical side effects you may expect from uh, a checkpoint inhibitor CD setting, no new signals. I like to say that after that adjuvant studies, there were some interest also when the uh, local therapies used were not surgery, but other, for example, radiotherapy. You remember, I'm sure, this experimental uh, uh, study where SBRT uh, was combined with uh, immunotherapy and in the Pacific uh, uh, trial and there was a, a clear indication that you're getting a, a priming of the immune system and more infiltration by using uh, these agents. Indeed, very recently at the World Lung Cancer Meeting 2023, there were a presentation of a small phase two trial where patients were treated uh, with early stage, were treated with SAVRT, uh, uh, SAVR uh, at the standard doses versus the same treatment plus uh, immunotherapy for some term 12 weeks. In that case, nivolumab. And I just see here in terms of PFS and uh, OS as well, there was a, 
a, a clear uh, uh, improvement for PFR for patients treated with uh, SIVR plus uh, chemotherapy plus immunotherapy as compared to uh, uh, stereotactic radiation alone. And we have to wait for the immunotherapy for the overall survival to mature, but uh, the data are very significant. So just to summarize, we have data suggesting that immunotherapy with Pembro or Atezo is effective in early stage, for sure is reducing the risk of relapse. That is particularly true stage uh, two and three, and it looks like uh, high pressures are benefiting the most. This is consistent with the use of single agent immunotherapy in stage four, that the higher the expression, the higher the benefit. So at this point, the question is, is immunotherapy given before surgery any better? And should we combine with chemotherapy or give immunotherapy alone? Well, the data suggest in experimental models that if you use immunotherapy after surgery is not any better as compared to prior surgery. The neoadjuvant approach is better. As you see here, those patients treated with neoadjuvant do better as compared to those mice treated with adjuvant treatment. This is also true in other models, melanoma, breast cancer. Neoadjuvant is always better. Indeed, we have some data with new adjuvant treatment. Do you remember the uh, trial from the Hopkins suggesting that nivolumab induce a number of patients to have partial remissions with only a couple of shots of immunotherapy, some 10% of the patients are uh, uh, doing so, radiological responses. More importantly, you have uh, uh, some um, uh, partial pathological remissions, major pathological remission, that means decrease in the number of viable tumors to less than 10% in some uh, nearly half of the patients, 45%. And more importantly, that was a clear infiltration when you compare the samples before immunotherapy as compared to those samples after nivolumab in this trial. Indeed, there is a very interesting study in melanoma that I have mentioned where patients were treated with um, surgery and then one year of pembrolizumab versus some cycles of uh, 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 pembrolizumab, then surgery, and then uh, adjuvant uh, pembrolizumab to heal one year of treatment. So the treatment arms were similar, but in the sequence uh, uh, that was somehow different for the new adjuvant treatment. And there was a clear improvement for the results of patients treated with new adjuvant treatment. And that was true across all the patients subset. So it looks like there is a claim for the use of new adjuvant treatment. And that seems to be quite logical, because if you like to uh, have an effective priming of the immune response, you need tumor antigens, you need tumor to be present, and you need the regional lymph nodes where the antigen presentation should happen. So you have your lung cancer resected, your lobectomy done, your uh, regional mediastinal nodes taken out, I think is more difficult the priming to occur. The second question is, is any better to use chemo IO as compared to chemo? Is chemotherapy helping to activate the immune response, to reverberate the immune response? And as you see here, the uh, higher, uh, the use of chemo IO improved the number of patients that in these experimental models that do have a, a, a nice response. So it looks like chemotherapy maybe in the neoadjuvant setting to be synergistic. 
And here is a number of studies with immunotherapy or with chemo immunotherapy. As you see here, the trial with chemo immunotherapy do result in higher response rate around 60-70%. More importantly, higher major pathological responses, 40-60%, to 60%, and more actually complete pathological responses between 30 and 40%. The numbers when you're using immunotherapy alone, single agent, are much lower with a complete responses in five to 10% of the cases, major pathological responses is on 30%. And this is a lot like half of what you expect with chemo -io. Indeed, the Nadim data, the first trial showed that uh, not only you're getting many patients having pathological responses, 60% in the initial trial with Nadim, but also very nice data on PFS and OS uh, in the long term, exceeding 75% uh, uh, survival at four years in this study. And then we have evidence from phase three trial. And I'm pretty sure that all of you are aware of the checkmate 8816 trial. This is a trial for patients with resectable stage 1b to 3a without genomic aberrations on EGFR or ALK. And patients asked after stratification by stage, PDR1 expression and gender, were actually randomized to receive chemo three courses versus chemo plus nivolumab three courses. After restaging, patients uh, uh, were followed up. This is uh, the main results. As you see here, there was a clear improvement in event-free survival. There was a decrease in the number of patients relapsing, has a ratio of 0.86. That means you were preventing one out of three relapses. Very impactful, if you look at the number of pathological responses, about 2% in those patients treated with chemo. This is consistent with historical data, but 44, 24%, one fourth of the individuals in patients treated with chemo IO, absolutely unbelievable. And indeed that is translating into a survival benefit as we have seen uh, in a most recent update some few months ago by Dr. Ford. The impact to in survival is pretty long. You're preventing one out of three deaths to happen in this patient population, which is very, very important. Another relevant fa uh, in, uh, finding in this study is that uh, the surgical side effects with chemo IO are not substantially different as compared to chemo alone. And that is relevant, I would say. And then uh, looking at surgical endpoints, uh, there were some ganancies very clear. Just to give you an idea, stage 3A, at the end of the day, 83% of the patients had operation on the chemo arm but 72% of them actually have it on the uh, chemo, sorry, 83% on the chemo IO arm versus 72% in the chemo arm. That means you're really increasing the number of patients, particularly with late stage, stage 3A, that finally do have access to a, I would say, oncologically, uh, uh, canonical uh, uh, resection, and indeed the use of uh, uh, minimal invasive surgery is more frequent in patients treated with chemo IO. The requirements to convert to open surgery is much higher if you use chemo alone. 
the requirement for pneumonectomy is nearly double if you do not use chemo -io. And as we mentioned, in any case, the completeness of the surgery is always higher by using a chemotherapy plus immunotherapy. Not only that, we learned that those patients on pathological CR are doing pretty well. We knew that with chemo, the only thing is only 2% of the patients are on pathological CR with chemo, but 22%, 24% of the patients do achieve a pathological CR if treated with chemo IO, and those patients are doing pretty well, very exceptionally relapse. Those patients not on CR are the ones that are relapsing. In terms of side effects, there is nothing striking to me, very close one arm to the other. And I would say there was no increase in surgery related adverse events. And uh, I, we didn't find any uh, new signal in those trials. Okay. Important to say then for new IO treatment, clear impact on hard endpoints, decrease in uh, the relapse rate in one third, decrease in number of patients dying of disease, one third, you're preventing one third of the deaths. And I think uh, uh, for the first time we are showing that maybe we are improving the surgical outcomes, less requirement for pneumonectomy, less requirement for open surgery, and uh, more frequently we achieve oncological surgeries. The question then is, if new adjuvant is working, is adjuvant immunotherapy is working, why don't we do both perioperative immunotherapy? And there are a number of trials ongoing. Indeed, if you look at all the trials with new adjuvant chemo, most of them, except the uh, checkmate A16, all the others actually do have a uh, part of treatment with uh, an adjuvant treatment phase. The initial trial delivered in this setting is the Nadine 2 trial. This is a, an academic trial that I think is worthy to review. A small number of patients, some 80 patients, typically all of them patients with locally advanced disease, all of them is stage 3A or 3B resectable. So that means patients with typically uh, uh, high stage. And they were treated with chemo alone or chemo plus IO, nivolumab in this case. And then after surgery, patients were offered six months of nivo in the experimental arm, no control, no treatment in the control arm. And as you see here, there was a huge impact in pathological CR rate, 7% versus 27%. And uh, clear improvement in the pace, number of patients that were uh, 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 having access to definitive surgery, 69% versus 93%. That means uh, an increase of, let's say, 25%. Uh, 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 and of course, also uh, an improvement in the number of uh, major pathological responses. You see here the important time-dependent endpoints, clear increase in PFS, has a ratio 0.48, clear increase in OS, has a ratio 0.4, and that means you're preventing more than half of the relapses, more than half of the deaths by the use of neoadjuvant plus adjuvant immunotherapy. And I think the data, even as small trials, some 90 patients, the trial is very important. Actually, those data were uh, um, validated on a larger trial. On the Aegean trial, I'm pretty sure you're aware of uh, this trial where patients with a stage uh, two to three B were actually 
uh, that were rejectable re uh, had a, a, a confirmed PDR1 status were randomized to receive chemo versus chemo plus Durba four courses, and then Durba for a year or uh, uh, placebo uh, uh, until a year. So important is a placebo control trial, clear improvement in the pathological uh, complete response rate, four versus 18%, 17%, and increase, clearly increase in the uh, um, event-free survival with a hazard ratio of 0.68. Just uh, as you see here, most of the patients upset, I would say all the patients upset seems to benefit in that uh, particular uh, sub-study. And uh, I'm just presenting you also some of the data recently presented at uh, World Lung Cancer Meeting, updating this trial. The important thing at the end of the day is that the number of patients completing surgery was very similar in the two cases. And I would say there was a, not a big difference in terms of the surgical outcomes in this very trial. Of course, uh, we didn't find any new signal in terms of uh, adverse event for patients treated with chemo IO as compared to IO. Indeed, the data were very similar. There was a third trial with very similar uh, uh, design and similar outcome. The so-called Keynote 671 trial. In that case, the population of patients were very similar, stage two, three, A and three B. And the chemotherapy was given according to histology three courses versus chemo IO with pembrolizumab, and then an adjuvant phase till one year with pembro or placebo. Important again, placebo controlled trial, very similar data done in the IGN, hazard ratio around 0.6. And you see here, all the patients were benefiting, and indeed the survival data are somehow uh, maturing, still pretty mature, but suggesting PFS likely to convert on a significant uh, OS ganancy. Again, confirmation that pathological CR rate improving from 4% to 18%, as we have seen before. And again, those patients on pathological CR were doing a lot better as compared to major pathological responses. And it is important because it looks like, or one of the interpretations across trial comparisons is that those patients that uh, have no complete pathological response, as you see here, maybe if adequate treatment is given, they have a less tendency to relapse as compared to what we have seen in the Checkmate 816 trial, of course, these are speculations after the observation across trial. This is not a randomized comparison, but that hypothesis should be further studied. In terms of the surgical details, it looks like the number of patients finally acceding to surgery is much higher in the chemo IO arm, 92% as compared to patients treated with chemo, 84%. So again, in most of the trial, I would say the treatment with chemo IO results in also improved surgical outcomes. And this is, I would say something important that we haven't seen before in other trials uh, before the immunotherapy era. The NeoTorch trial using toripalimab, very similar data. Again, in that case, the drug is toripalimab. Uh, they presented the data so far on the stage three disease. As you see, there is a clear improvement in pathological responses from two to 28%, sorry, from one to uh, 25%. 
that translate in a clear improvement in uh, um, uh, OS actually, also of course in PFS, has a ratio in the range of 0.6, as we have seen before. And if you look at the surgical outcomes again, it looks like the number of patients finally uh, uh, having access to surgery, uh, having definitive surgery is at least uh, some 10 to 12% uh, higher in patients treated with chemo IO as compared to uh, chemo alone. Again, reinforcing the fact that surgical outcomes may be better with chemo IO. So taking all those messages together, uh, I will summarize that uh, immunotherapy approaches are actually invading the uh, adjuvant and new adjuvant setting for early stage. I think uh, uh, teams are changing, still a number of interrogants are there. What is the impact of uh, the chemo IO or adjuvant IO on survival is clear. What is the impact in, in cure is still not as clear as yet. We have to better define which are the populations that should receive chemo IO neoadjuvantly, which patients should receive only adjuvant immunotherapy, and which patients may receive one and the other. Of course, stage three, I'm pretty sure that we will do chemo IO for most of the cases. Stage 1A, maybe we will use immunotherapy alone uh, in many cases. I'm actually uh, more a, a, a new adjuvant uh, uh, fan as compared to adjuvant. So it's very likely that we tend to do chemo IO even in stage 2 as compared to IO alone. And of course, in any case, we need further uh, uh, definition of how long should we should we use the immunotherapy for? Should we stop immunotherapy after a pathological CR on the adjuvant phase? Should we continue immunotherapy for those patients that didn't achieve a pathological CR? Well, I think we can discuss that uh, uh, during the discussion uh, time. And of course, in any case, for sure, we need some more uh, predictive biomarkers uh, uh, in this setting. Those are some of the questions that, as I mentioned, should be addressed. And with that, I think I uh, will leave you uh, for the time. Thank you very much. I'll be pretty happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. I would now like to invite our experts, Dr. Vaibhav Chaudhary, medical oncologist from Mumbai, and Dr. Shubham Garg, surgical oncologist from Noida. Over to you, sir. Uh, very good evening uh, to everybody. Uh, I'll just take a brief five minutes to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Parez. Uh, Dr. Parez happens to be the chair of medical oncology at the university uh, hospital at 12th day October. He's also the head of the lung cancer unit at the Spanish National Cancer Research Center. He also happens to be the president of the Spanish Association of Cancer Research. Undoubtedly, uh, he has the clinical expertise and he has under him uh, as many as more than 300 publications in uh, the best of the peer-reviewed journals, which includes NAGM, Lancet, uh, Nature, and the Journal of Clinical Oncology. He is also a committee member of ASCO, ESMO, and the European Organization for Research and Treatment of Cancer. Uh, so a very warm welcome, uh, Dr. Perez, and thank you so much for your lecture. I'm sure it will be an eye-opener for all of us and will be a starter for a lot of conversations, which uh, in the panel discussion, Dr. Batra will take forward. Uh, Webhav? Hi, hi. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Ullas, for uh, giving me this opportunity to uh, post certain uh, pertinent important questions actually to Dr. Lewis. So uh, uh, it's my privilege actually to uh, ask such questions and 
listen from the uh, your a uh, person who has got expertise in all the areas wherever the trials have been conducted new adjuvant adjuvant as well as peri so sir coming straight to the uh, question one which actually you touched upon during your conclusion slide what is your preference sir uh, is it more new adjuvant which is always all the medical oncologists love it obviously new adjuvant adjuvant or a peri one because the peri data is also evolving sir you take on that you know, I, I, I we tend to do more uh, new IUI treatment. Uh, so uh, even in the chemotherapy era, we use a lot of new IUI treatment for sure for stage three, even for stage two. Uh, you know, very often you have a stage two patients, and uh, in my country particularly is. Uh, uh, most of the patients are treated on NHS hospital. So you may have a waiting list of three weeks, four weeks. So for the stage two patients, we tend to give, we know that they are going to receive chemotherapy anyway. The delivery of chemotherapy, of chemotherapy is much easier before surgery, and we tend to do chemo, uh, to chemo before that. Then, since the result of the Nadine trial, that was a Spanish trial, even academic, and then the other phase three, uh, we, of course, are not doing chemo anymore. We do chemo iron, and uh, we think uh, it's a better idea. On the other hand, you know, it's very contraintuitive to take out the tumor, take out the regional nodes, and then start immunotherapy. Because you need that for the for having a good priming, so just three courses of chemo IO is a good uh, uh, idea to go and then uh, uh, consider or not to do adjuvant treatment. Maybe the exception are patients with small tumors, stage one, even maybe some stage two A. If you're not uh, having any issues with waiting list. That would be okay. But uh, I think uh, all those patients should be presented to the multidisciplinary team. I think the reason why new algebra treatment is less used is in many cases because the multidisciplinary team is actually not uh, taking too much part of the decision. A good example is, you know, you go to the community centers in US, very little new adjuvant treatment. And this is because the, I would say, surgeon take the patient, operate it, and send it to the oncologist. I think maybe the best way to do it could be just before the patient is treated, just get all the cases all together, the multidisciplinarity in. Uh, decide what is the best way to go. Uh, sir, this brings me to the next question because there is convincing data now for new adjuvant and uh, yeah, it is, uh, we are pretty much convinced. Uh, other the, the issue where patient is not a surgical candidate, patient is a candidate for CTRT. In those patients also, would you prefer uh, any CT plus IO? Sorry, could you repeat the question? I didn't hear very well. The CTRT patients, those patients who are unresectable, who are not a candidate for surgery, non-surgical candidate, uh, either way, maybe medically or uh, uh, patient is not fit as well. Patient are for CTRT, definitive CTRT. In those patients, do you prefer IO plus uh, NACT before CTRT also? <clears throat> At present, we um, we tend to do chemo radiation first and then immunotherapy. The reason is because we haven't got robust phase three data suggesting that chemo radio immunotherapy altogether is any better as compared to chemo radiation followed by immunotherapy. There are at least three phase three trials ongoing evaluating the early start of immunotherapy in this setting, but we haven't got the data. We got some phase two data suggesting that the strategy is feasible, but we haven't got strong data to recommend it. Right. 
Sir, so there is one uh, surgical pertinent questions in the presentation that you had shown. There was very interesting data that there is almost there are more minimal access surgery following chemo IO as compared to uh, standard chemotherapy. There is greater completion of surgery. But what I couldn't find was, uh, you know, blood loss. What what was the average blood loss following? Probably this is a more surgical question, but I, I thought there would be data where there would be, is there more blood loss associated with the surgeries in chemo IOs? To be honest, I don't think we have, an, at least that I know, those data are not, uh, uh, I, I, I'm not aware of. Maybe okay. there are some data okay. on that, but I, I didn't see them. Okay. I have to say that I'm a medical oncologist. Maybe when reading the data, I was not focusing on that, and I don't remember them. But uh, you know, so sorry about that. That's 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 all. That's all right. Jay. What about what about the uh, response assessment imaging that you would do in a patient who's a borderline resectable following chemo IO? Would you be happy to do it with just a contrast enhanced CT scan, or would you want to get a PET CT scan done to assess the response? Uh -huh. To be honest, I think a CT scan is good. I think it's as good, at least, as PET scan, because the, we see quite often uh, nodal flare unrelated to the disease because of the immune stimulation. So PET scan is particularly short term, like after three courses, is not great. Indeed, this is a major difficulty. It's really difficult to assess the response to chemo IO. We have seen many cases where we, you know, we present the case to the multidisciplinary team, decided three courses of chemo IO, delivered the chemo IO. A CT scan didn't show much change, even in some cases, you were doubting some progression. The surgeons, you know, at the, the multidisciplinary thing, we were doubting about even going to the surgery or not. The patient was at bed that maybe would be kind of a, a white thoracotomy without nothing there. And at the end, the patient was a pathological CR. Wow. Pathological CR. So I remember, so the question is, is really difficult to predict. Therefore, if you decided to do chemo IO for your patient and the patient is having possibilities of being resectable, I think you have to go for it because unless you do it, it's really difficult to predict. The question may, many people would say, well, if 25% of the patients are on pathological CR, maybe you don't need to okay. do surgery. Well, I think it's, it's too risky at this stage. I don't think we are able to evaluate. We can, I mean, it's impossible to say there is not one, 10 or a hundred or a thousand cells. So I wouldn't risk at this stage. Maybe when we are more confident, but uh, today I think we still need the surgery, at least. And uh, uh, I think so, at least. Good, good to hear from you that surgery stays and is still a part of the <laughs> surgical domain. So I think I think we are just crossing our time limit. Weber, we'll we'll hand it back to the organizers. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you so much, sir. Gives me great pleasure to invite our moderator, Dr. Lars Patra, medical oncologist from New Delhi, and our panelists, Dr. Luis Pazaris, Dr. Ramakan Deshpande, Dr. N.K. Warrior, Dr. Vineet Govind Gupta, Dr. Anita Ramesh, Dr. Prabhat Malik, and Dr. Amit Rotten. So please note, Dr. Arvind Kumar will not be able to join us for the panel discussion. Uh, thank you, and can I please uh, share my screen? Yes, okay. I that was nice. Um, you know, um, uh, can I just ask, is my screen visible? And uh, Yes, sir. It's visible. Uh, sir. I'm audible. It's been a long time since I used that word, actually. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pa Luis Pazares. It was, uh, you know, 
uh, it was fun to listen it was a wonderful master class is what i would tell you we have heard you a lot about immunotherapy in the early in the late stage cancers uh, but looking at immunotherapy coming out uh, in uh, early stage lung cancer resectable stage lung cancer is is fantastic actually uh, and my fellow panelists here are uh, dr ramakant deshpande surgical oncologist from mumbai dr nk warrior a medical oncologist from kozhikode dr amit rautan dr vaibhav dr shubham and dr anita ramesh and dr vinit govindan gupta uh, let me just present my size and i know uh, dr pazares has to leave at 7 another 15 minutes from now uh, so uh, first of all thank you for your time for the way your slides were made for the clarity and thought that you have and for the fact that you were able to impart that quality that quality to all the listeners so thank you uh, i am sure this uh, has really uh, you know cleared off a lot of uh, uh, conceptions and misconception that we all have over there and uh, let me just start with my presentation about the revolution in the management of resectable and unresectable non small cell lung cancer i still remember around 5 7 years back on the occasion of breast cancer survivors day we were asked uh, about why not have a lung cancer survivor day you know i mean this was the ceo of the of the of the institute who came and asked and you know my reaction at that time basically were are you like joking you know lung cancer survivor day so i actually asked him sir uh, you know you you need to have survivors uh, you know five years six years survivors to have those things it was not fair it was not fair for lung cancer oncologists actually and my subsequent reaction at that time or be patient and that is what my ceo also told me things will change for the better and uh, uh, things will you know all things are difficult before they become easy and i'm sure the things are becoming easy right now it's also very heartening to see that we have two surgical oncologists in the early lung cancer discussion and we have five medical oncologists so uh, i hope dr ramakant deshpande has joined although dr ramakant deshpande is one is enough for uh, Uh, all the medical oncologists and that's the answer that i'm going to get from him but dr ramakant deshpande sir good evening good evening good evening ulas oh you have turned uh, into the modi mode sir <laughs> no 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 this is all because of the shravan <laughs> okay but okay. over just now yes <laughs> okay. dr ramakant deshpande sir you know i remember having this discussion you know media stenoscopy went to the uh, went to the pulmonologist the as the early stage radiation and this and now you know immunotherapy is coming on to this so what do you feel surgery is going to stay surgery is going to come back surgery is going to expand in the early stage lung cancer i am extremely happy anything that actually helps improve the overall survival uh, you know there used to be a time when uh, overall survival for all comers together used to be 6% for lung cancer and that is in particularly for advanced stage uh, till 15 years back till 2009 it was absolutely just you know go home and get lucky for all those stage 4 malignancy people uh, because you know not even not even 5% would live for uh, one year and i think uh, the medical oncology colleagues have absolutely turned the whole world around by the uh, mutation therapy by immunotherapy you know what is happening is actually more and more uh, patients particularly in 3a 3b are becoming more operable see ultimately anything that gives to uh, gives us a pathologically complete response does help cures that is established for all malignancies you know not only for lung cancer and i think immunotherapy is here to contribute much more for that so i'm i'm very happy that you know you are probably going to ultimately create uh, stage 1 out of stage 4 by giving chemo immunotherapy over a period of time and that's how we talk in terms of you know limited stage uh, lung cancer stage 4 and even there there is a role of surgery so okay. role of surgery is going to change the way we see it so it's not going to disappear so i'm very happy that more and more patients are getting cured or at least living longer so dr ramakant sir i mean this is this discussion is about resectable non small cell lung cancer yes i'll address this first question to you and then to dr uh, luis pazares for his comments because as i said he would be leaving in another 10 minutes so i want to extract maximum out of him and then uh, our indian colleagues so are you also feeling you know i mean taking a corollary from the from the breast cancer you know we had a uh, uh, operable we had inoperable locally advanced do you think i mean right now i am not saying that we will convert an unresectable lung cancer do you think some day 
N3 operable lung cancer, technically operable lung cancer, but N3 contralateral lymph node. Are you going to or are we going, both of us going to convert an inoperable lung cancer by the way of immunochemotherapy to an operable lung cancer? And this was a huge thing. You know, uh, Twitter RT went uh, uh, left, right, and sent bonkers about and all the Neotorch and other trials. They are convert they are taking people with 3B also. AGN didn't take, but Neotorch and other trials are taking. So I would like to hear the <coughs> surgeon's comment first. And then the medical oncologist comment. And let's have some fun. So Dr. Deshpande first. Yeah. Uh, it's quite possible the way you see it. See, ultimately, uh, surgery or chemotherapy or immunotherapy are means to an end of prolonging the patient. And what, what differentiates a curable or a non-curable kind of a modality of treatment is the patient completes the modality of treatment and he lives long. So if you are looking at, you know, normally now 3B or four stage four we don't even consider for surgery because even if you operate these patients are not going to become all right and at least not with a significant uh, length of survival and now here is a modality that's immunotherapy and chemotherapy quite often makes a lot of disease disappear leaving maybe only a small portion of the disease and then you follow the whole thing with immunotherapy later on uh, and pro prolong the survival for a long period of time so, uh, yes, uh, very likely that as time goes by, probably within maybe like how you have seen tremendous changes in the last 15 years, maybe next 15 years we'll see uh, more and more uh, kind of changes. But okay. not only that, when you have the uh, checkpoint inhibitors positive, you're seeing that so many so-called stage four uh, diseases, I don't want to take names, but uh, there is a huge personality, a very well-known personality was diagnosed in stage four is living disease free today, three years down the line, working absolutely but, disease free. So but without surgery, that. sir. Now, what no I'm surgery, saying, no surgery. Yeah. So, <laughs> what I'm saying is, what I'm asking is, and Dr. Pazar is, I mean, this is one point which comes to my and the uh, which is there. 3B, we don't operate because we realize that, you know, by the time you operate them, the patient recovers and the morbidity, maybe he will throw a met here and there. And that is why CTRT is more preferable. Quite right. Do you think, uh, Dr. Pazar is, I mean, I mean, are we going to convert an inoperable lung cancer, maybe some pulmonary artery inflammation by uh, into that? Your thoughts on that? Yeah. <clears throat> you know, I mean, the main reason uh, why patients with, uh, with N3 that are not candidates for surgery is not because it's not uh, surgically feasible to reset the microscopic disease. Many surgeons are able to do it. The problem is that if you are in three, there is a high risk of micrometastatic disease, and that makes unworthy the surgery for the patient. We have seen here that uh, actually neoadjuvant chemo immunotherapy is particularly effective at preventing the micrometastatic, the systemic relapse. So I think some of the classical contraindications for surgery, at some point, we need the trials. We have the basis to do the trials. We haven't got the results as yet, but I think there are bases to try to go on with trials in patients that were considered unresectable. Indeed, if you go and look at the Nadine's two trial, more than 42% of the patients were N2 multiple nodal stations that in many regions of the world, those are contraindications for surgery. <clears throat> Indeed, imagine an N3 a disease, you have a chance of 24% of entering into complete response. Well, I think it's not... Uh, 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 I mean, it makes sense to maybe try it. Yep. So, Indeed, I'm just telling you that we are uh, somehow uh, very close to it, to start such a trial in the Spanish lung cancer group. That's nice. So my question again to you, Dr. Pazar, is, is you give three cycles of, uh, let's say it's a 3B disease or 3C by the uh, N3 disease. We give uh, three cycles of neoadjuvant uh, chemo immuno and the patient remains unresectable. Are you going to do a 
pseudo pacific or a la pacific after that or how are you going to then that's a very practical yeah. question which happens to all of us in the, in the setting what are we thinking at this stage is that we will do a chemo radiation and then go on immunotherapy then go on immunotherapy so let me ask uh, dr shubham uh, dr shubham uh, in your practice in the in the resectable one uh, are you still going uh, uh, doing going ahead only with surgery which are the patients you will go ahead only with surgery in your clinical practice right now stage 1 to stage 3 and which are the patients you would like to give new adjuvant chemo immuno what i'm asking you is adjuvant versus new adjuvant versus direct upfront surgery what's your choice so even now in the clinical practice we are going with upfront surgery to begin with only in the patients where we have borderline resectability or we feel that uh, the there is single end to we were offering new adjuvant therapy new adjuvant chemo io is still not uh, very acceptably taken up by patients because of a lot of cost reasons but uh, we are looking forward to having more and more trial patients actually after today after today's talk will you be tempted to you know with an with an efs advantage will you be tempted to what will no, be no. in your mind no 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 we are we are always tempted to offer them but there is there is this big uh, uh, point where the patients themselves do not agree for uh, a, a chemotherapy where there is a surgical option available and it takes a lot of convincing to get them out of that mindset. Okay, fantastic. Uh, Dr. Amit Rathan, uh, you are a very hardcore medical oncologist. Should we send these patients to you and you will convince them for uh, new adjuvant chemo immuno? So we are very strong believers of new adjuvant. So anyone stage two and above, uh, I would say strongly do new adjuvant chemo immuno followed by surgery. So we so we've actually done this and when the NADIM data came, we had our first patient with IO uh, chemo followed by, we, we, after that we have now, now a group of patients and amazing path CR. So we are strong believers of this new adjuvant immuno chemo followed by surgery. Hey, so uh, you said about path CR and EFS and DFS and everything. So my question now is, you know, uh, it depends on which which symposia or which state of thing you go. There is no OS advantage till now. And everybody has changed its setting. And if I just show you this, uh, you know, uh, if I just show you the endpoints over here, adjuvant, you have a DFS as a primary endpoint. In the new adjuvant, you have uh, the PF, the PCRs and everything as an endpoint. My question is, uh, are we convinced? I mean, I'll ask uh, Dr. Um, I'll ask Dr. Prabhat Malik first about the DFS and the OS story. And then as again, as usual, I'll ask uh, Dr. Pazares. I mean, are you expecting, is it the PCR or a EFS, DFS good enough for you? Prabhat, if you can let me know on your thoughts on this. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, the uh, these, uh, the best endpoint for any adjuvant or new adjuvant study would be overall survival. I do agree. But uh, you need to see this in a bigger perspective. Uh, the perspective for new adjuvant, which is more exciting, that you get an in, uh, vi uh, in vivo sensitivity of the uh, treatment which you are giving. So if you see the patients who are achieving paths here, either it is uh, by chemotherapy or by chemoimmunotherapy, both these patients are living longer and disease-free. So, Prabhat, my question is, you're just knowing these people are living more. I mean, if you go ahead and give them, you know, new adjuvant chemotherapy, the advantage was 5%, new ad and adjuvant therapy, it was 4%, sorry, ULTA. So, right. it doesn't make it, you just come to know which are these patients. Are we lowering the bar for the approval? And, you know, Dr. Pazar, before you, you know, before you, I mean, leave the, uh, the thing webinar, your thoughts on EFS, PCR, I'm being a hardcore uh, critic. I'm being the devil's advocate. Okay, so truly, um, you know, OS is always uh, a good endpoint and the best endpoint. <clears throat> Indeed, uh, I have to say that, uh, you know, uh, event free survival or uh, relapse rate or that, they are very good endpoints in this uh, early stage setting. Because, you know, uh, we know that most of the patients that die of the disease are patients that do have relapse within the initial two years. So you're getting a EFS hazard ratio of 0.6. I mean, uh, it's very likely it's going to translate into survival. So 
you know, uh, for example, we have seen a lot of trials. Truly, uh, the, there are some trials already positive for survival, but based on very immature data. What is mature is the EFS. Uh, this is allowing us to start using these uh, very important approaches. So I really believe uh, OS is the best, but I trust EFS, particularly if the magnitude of the benefit is huge to really start using that. I think, I really think pathological CR is important to do trials. Let's say it's a good endpoint for a, you like to use a new combination of immunotherapies, you know, you may do use a early endpoint on phase two trials, like uh, that. a pathological CR is good. You don't need to wait for five years, but I don't think is the best endpoint for phase two trials. So I think a very important point, which, which Dr. Pazar has said, there's a magnitude of the uh, of the improvement that we get. You know, I mean, look at the other. You know, previously when we saw the the chemotherapy, the HR at that time was 0 0.87, 0 0.89, 0 0.91. And now with chemo immuno, this is the Asian trial in which we also participated uh, uh, from India. And uh, this is the EFS, which was basically shown over here with the magnitude of S, you know, 0 0.68, a p-value absolutely significant. So let me do the cardinal sin of medical oncology. And the cardinal sin of medical oncology is a cross-trial comparison. So we have, you know, we have the perioperative approaches. We have the new age juvenile approaches. The Checkmate 816 versus this. My first question, Dr. Anita Ramesh, to you is, if you have a patient who is willing for a new age juvenile chemo immunotherapy, you have, I'll just, you know, we all know the PCR rates are to the tune of 10, 20, the MPR rates are to the tune of 25%. Everybody has the same advantage. The PDL one expression over here, if you see, the less the PDL one, the less the uh, the advantage. Uh, this is the keynote uh, trial, which again basically said if you have more PDL one, it is more important. Uh, this was the checkmate eight one six basically, which showed again that less the PDL one, which is uh, less advantage. However, when you came to the approvals, the FDA has approved nivolumab for irrespective of PDL one. The EMA has, as usual, approved it for more than one percent one. So. Do you think PDL one per, uh, percentage is more important or is important in the new adjuvant setting also? That's a question I want to ask you. Uh, yes, see, the PDL one percentage actually varies from trial to trial, from drug to drug. We have seen in the metastatic setting as well. Like second line, you don't need to do a PDL one testing at all. Yes, and nivolumab is one of the drugs where PDL one less. But in my practice, if I have to give an immunotherapy to any of these patients, I would like to give and see taking other logistics into consideration. A higher PDL one is the target uh, population where I am going to go. At least more than forty nine percent of PDL one positivity will be my first choice to give the immunotherapy. Though data are conflicting, I, we are not sure about the FDA approvals on these drugs and the expedited FDA approval. And I'm sure all of us have read the reviews, how the newer drugs came into with many other uh, problems inside. So still, for my practice, PDL one uh, high level holds good for an immunotherapy, uh, new adjuvant. Uh, treatment for uh, all these non sponsored lung cancers. Fantastic. So, Dr. Pazar, raised two questions I have for you. PDL, I mean, new adjuvant chemo immunotherapy in patients who are PDL1 less than 1%. And once you answer this, I'll come to the adjuvant setting after that. Okay. You know, the you go to the uh, 817 trial, the pathological CR rate is 24% with chemo IO, is higher if you are high PDL1 expressor and is lower, you are lower. Still, you have a tumor which is PDL1 negative. The pathological CR rate is actually 17%. Still a lot. Uh, still eight times higher as compared to Kimolon. So I think it's important to know the PDL1 status, but particularly for Kimo-IO, even PDL1 negative patients are good candidates. Maybe the magnitude of the benefit is going to be lower, 
but I would not deny the potential for benefit for PDL one negative patients. So uh, thank you. That was that was very nice. Uh, the second corollary to that question because. I am very fearful of the fact that you will just uh, say that this is my last question. I'm asking you more questions before you disappear, Dr. Aris Pazaris. If in an adjuvant setting, I have a patient who is T3 N1 M0, the PDL1 is negative, uh, less than one. Uh, the guy is willing for atezolizumab. The atezolizumab in our is has an approval of more than one person. Uh, pembrolizumab has the one which has got the this thing, but pembrolizumab is not approved in our country. But just in case it was there. Would you give adjuvant atezolizumab to a patient of T3N1, PDL1 less than one? Or would you say, I'll give you Pembro in that? To be honest, uh, that is, uh, you know, uh, we are too much uh, stretched and concerned by our regulatory rules. Just to start with, I would say, I'm not sure a TISO and PEMBRO are any different okay. in the yeah. adjuvant setting. So even the label is not going to be the same. You know, I think, uh, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not convinced they are any different. Secondly, uh, I'm convinced that uh, for immunotherapy single agent, the higher the expression, the higher the benefit. If that patient is negative, you know, maybe the likelihood of benefit is lower. If you look at the data in the ATISO trial, the hazard ratio for PDL1 negative expression is 0.8. It's not huge, but you know, it's still worth it. For chemotherapy is lower and it's more toxic, and we do it. So uh, likely I would do it. But to be honest, if I knew my patient was a T3 and one. I will never try to do surgery and then uh, uh, immuno. I will try to do chemo IO first and then uh, surgery. The second thing is, even in the adjuvant setting, there are no trials, but you know, I tend not to do chemo and then IO because. Uh, uh, you're prolonging the time of treatment and you're delaying the start of immunotherapy. So I tend to do chemo IO four courses and then complete immuno until one year. That is what I'm doing in the practice. I'm not saying everyone should do it because there are no trials, but this is the truth what I'm doing. I don't think any is any point that I'm treating my stage four patients with chemo IO and why should not I do it on my stage three patients uh, directly instead of doing sequential treatment. Okay, that was fantastic. So you're doing an adjuvant keynote 189. That's nice. We will have to look for the results for that. That's fantastic. So let me come to Dr. Warrior. Uh, um, we have so many questions to ask, so many doubts to address. Dr. Warrior, uh, your personal choice, a checkmate 816 or a AGN, a new adjuvant or a perioperative. Uh, the results seem to be almost similar. Uh, your choice, sir. What would you feel? Uh, what would, and you think event phase survival is good enough for that? Yeah, well, that's uh, one important point. Uh, I don't know whether I have missed out or you people have uh, forgotten. Is the, all the earlier uh, the, the clinical trials, uh, the uh, twenty percent of patients have missed out uh, the uh, possibility of surgery. Uh, they would have uh, undergone surgery if they have uh, taken up front. And that is one thing. And uh, then considering the uh, the ease of uh, giving uh, and the financial part, I would definitely go for the Nivo Chemo as it is only uh, some three uh, three cycles. Uh, but uh, we don't know whether the short-term chemotherapy versus long-term uh, uh, adjuvant treatment uh, is beneficial. But uh, since the AG uh, AG uh, trial is uh, uh, has shown a very good uh, result and that that is for one year adjuvant and uh, uh, four cycles of uh, chemo immuno before. Uh, I will uh, definitely consider uh, and come back uh, and wait for some more results to come. Okay. So uh, let me ask uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Vin uh, Vinod Govindan if, if Vinit is there. Uh, Vinit, uh, there are a lot of questions about, you know, 
the trials are not being designed in one way. You know, uh, a lot of criticism for Adora went into how many people got OC Mertinib at relapse. So, uh, Vineet, if you are there, or maybe then Vaibhav can take it uh, if he is there. Uh, you know, what happens when the honeymoon phase is over? So, is it uh, how many people actually get immunotherapy at, uh, at relapse? Uh, so, let's say you have given three cycles of perioperative chemotherapy, surgery, only chemotherapy, and then at relapse, not everybody got chemo immunotherapy to start with. Do you think that is a concern? Uh, what happens at relapse? Do you think that is the one which we which is tilting the overall survival benefit in the in the in the better side? We, uh, Vibhav, you can take this. Yeah, 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 yeah. That is that may be one of the uh, uh, points, and uh, that may lead to a better uh, DFS. What we are seeing here, but the whole idea of medicine, uh, forget about the uh, oncology, is to basically. Uh, take the disease when it is at the weakest and that will be in the new adjuvant setting rather than a relapse refractory setting where there will be resistant clones and there were a lot of issues managing that. So putting the best foot forward would be the idea and that's why whatever maybe the KB at in the trials and all ultimately everyone designs trial according to their understanding but then new adjuvant makes a strong case as compared to waiting for the relapse. Okay. So let me ask, uh, because we are, I think we just got five more minutes to go. Uh, let's see uh, over here, you know, uh, will we, so this is the people who achieved a PCR with Pembro and uh, uh, this thing. And these are people who did not achieve a Pembro, a PCR with a Pembrolizumab. I mean, this is the keynote uh, trial basically. So let's say somebody gets three cycles of neoadjuvant chemotherapy and gets a PCR. How many people, uh, let me ask Prabhat, Prabhat, will you continue checkmate at that time, uh, nivolumab at that time, or will you stop? So a person who has got a PCR with that, will you stop? Will you continue? So uh, if a person has got PCR, uh, maybe we can stop. Uh, mm -hmm. People who do not have PCR, we can continue. We do not have direct head-to-head -head such comparison. These are again uh, indirect comparisons which we are talking about. So uh, if you show the similar graphs for the checkmate 816, so they are exactly a replica of that. Yes. Even if you do not give them adjuvant, so these uh, curves who have received new adjuvant, these curves remain higher. Okay. So, I mean, this is an indirect way of saying that, see, that patient, because in this trial, patients have got adjuvant pembrolizumab, they are um, having a better DFS, may not be appropriate. But yes, I do agree that patients who have not achieved a I mean, pathological response with your new adjuvant treatment are relatively higher risk. And giving a subsequent treatment make more sense to these patients who have achieved a PCR probably uh, is an overkill for them, uh, both in terms of uh, toxicities and financial toxicity. Fantastic. Dr. Pazares, your thoughts? Three cycles of Checkmate 816, patient is paying out of his own pocket, has a PCR. Uh, will you continue uh, the nivolumab? If money is also... No, no, no. So if the patient has a pathological CR, I'll stop it. You will stop it. And the patient does not have a PCR, should be doing trials, yeah. ADC is so, the same yeah. thing? You know, that is a patient that my ideal choice would be to, to go for a trial where an alternative immunotherapy is given. If not, you know, we have some data, not very robust, that maybe continuing is good. If you look at it, you know, if you look at the slope of the curve, on the uh, perioperative chemotherapy uh, trials, uh, you see that, uh, for example, this uh, 671, the slope of this curve here you're showing is lower as compared to the uh, checkmate, where those patients with treaties that stop immunotherapy, they tend to maybe go a bit uh, farther down. So that is a belief, and you know, in the initial study of uh, Najim, some patients had, uh, after surgery, uh, uh, have um, uh, uh, not in, in pathological CR. Some patients had NEVO, some patients didn't have adjuvant NEVO. We found that those patients with adjuvant NEVO, they did a bit better as compared to the others. So we don't know. So I tend to do it if the patients are not in pathological CR. Okay, so my last question, uh, since we are absolutely out of time is to the surgeons. 
surgeons 20 percent people not going for surgery are you happy or anyway the dwindling down curve is going to get shrink more shubham so i was just wondering whether this is cancelled surgeries or patients who could not come up for surgery so cancelled would mean that they were planned for surgery predominantly because of progressive disease or poor yes, disease. yes 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 yeah but so that is that is that is the take off when you give a new adjuvant therapy and you have to take it as a bitter pill okay 20% is good enough so my point over there is please do an ngs prior to getting an immunotherapy starting a new adjuvant chemoimmuno if you have an egfr alk please don't go ahead and give them chemoimmuno because you will have egg on your face later on uh to me and my take on this is on my last slide uh neo and peri adjuvant immunotherapy non small cell resectable lung cancer is absolutely like this it is a new thing it is a new fab thing and it is going to really come over there and since we are absolutely short of time and uh, got up this i would like to close the panel discussion right now and i'd like to uh, thank everybody uh, including dr luis pazares and everyone uh, for their fantastic discussions and a great point learning point thank you uh, thanks a lot and till we meet again thank you thank you bye and with this, I would like to close the uh, program. And thank you for everybody who has come and joined. Um, it was great having all of you.